What's up, AP Psych Brainiacs? Welcome to the first video in a series designed to help you crush the AP Psychology exam and maybe start psychoanalyzing your friends along the way. In this video, we're diving into what it means to think like a psychologist, which, spoiler alert, basically means thinking like a scientist. Because here's the thing, psychologists don't guess and they definitely don't base conclusions on random opinions or what someone's friend's cousin said on TikTok. They use research, data, and a scientific method to figure out why people think, feel, and behave the way they do. Now, here's something important to note. This topic falls under what I call unit zero, the unit that technically doesn't exist, but totally matters. Think of it as the pilot episode of a TV show. If you skip it, you're confused the whole season. So, if you're ready, grab your notes, fire up those neurons, let's jump in. We'll kick things off with a really important question. Why does psychological research even matter? Here's a short answer. Psychological research helps separate gut feelings from facts. It gives us real evidence-based answers to questions like, does social media actually impact mental health? Do parenting styles lead to more confident kids? Do video games really affect attention spans? And why do I suddenly remember every embarrassing thing I've ever done right before falling asleep? From therapy to the workplace, research helps psychologists understand and improve behavior. But what happens when we ignore the science? As smart as people are, we tend to fall back on instincts, gut feelings, and highly questionable logic, like believing you're totally compatible with your crush because you're both Capricorns. Ugh, don't get me started on horoscopes. And while those things might feel right in the moments, they're often misleading or just plain wrong. Which brings us to a major obstacle in psychology, and honestly in life, cognitive biases. These are the mental shortcuts our brains take that can seriously mess with how we think, remember, and make decisions. Let's start with a simple example. Imagine you're watching someone spin a roulette wheel. It's landed on red five times in a row. The next spin has to be black, right? That feeling you have that black is due is what we call the gambler's fallacy. Your brain thinks that past random events somehow influence what happens next, even when the odds haven't changed at all. That's not logic, that's your gut talk. And while your gut is great for picking snacks, it's not great for science. So let's break down a few cognitive biases you need to know for the AP exam. First up, confirmation bias. This is when we seek out information that confirms what we already believe and ignore anything that challenges it. When it comes to psychological research, confirmation bias can lead scientists to look for evidence that supports their hypothesis and ignore contradictory data. Keep this in mind, AP Psych students, confirmation bias shows up again in Unit 4 when discussing stereotypes. Is it really true that all cat people are quiet and weird, or is your brain just looking for what it already believes? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Next is hindsight bias. This is the tendency to believe, after something has happened, that we knew it all along, even if we didn't actually predict it. Like when your favorite sports team loses and you say, I knew they were going to blow it. Really? Because two hours ago you were yelling, Championship! Here we come! Classic sports fan. And finally, overconfidence bias. We tend to overestimate our knowledge, abilities, or the accuracy of our judgments whether it's expecting to ace a test we didn't study for or assume we were always right. This one's your gentle reminder to stay humble, my friends. So, how do psychologists deal with all these mental shortcuts and biases? They start by asking clear, testable questions, questions that could be supported or challenged by evidence. And that means writing a good hypothesis. But not just any guess will do. To count as scientific, a hypothesis must be falsifiable. That is, it must be possible to test it and potentially prove it wrong. Here's an example of a falsifiable hypothesis. Students who get at least eight hours of sleep will score higher on memory tests than those who get less than six hours. You can test it, you can collect data, and if the results show no difference, boom, the hypothesis is disproven. And that's still a win for science. Now, compare that to something like this. Dreams reflect your soul's deepest truths. Sounds deep, even poetic. But how would you test it or prove it wrong? You can't, and that's the problem. If there's no way to disprove it, it's not science. It's philosophy or maybe horoscopes. Oh my God, once again, horoscopes. Breathe. After generating a clear hypothesis, psychological researchers need to be crystal clear about how they're gonna test it. That's where operational definitions come in. An operational definition spells out exactly what you're measuring and how you're measuring it. No guesswork, no vague terms. Studying happiness? You'll need to define what counts as happiness. Is it a mood survey? The number of smiles per hour? Levels of serotonin in the brain? Let's break down operational definitions with a quick analogy. 
Imagine you're trying to bake cookies, and the recipe just says, use a little bit of sugar, throw in some eggs, and bake it hot until it feels done. Sounds delicious? Until your cookies come out flat, burned, or weirdly eggy. Now imagine somebody asked for their recipe so they could make it themselves. Yeah, not gonna end well. Science works the same way. A good study, like a good recipe, needs specific measurable steps that anyone can follow. That way the study can be replicated by other researchers and the findings can be trusted. All right, let's hit the AP Psych pause button. Before we move on, don't rush past operational definitions. They're more important than they sound. This concept shows up everywhere in AP Psychology. And yes, you will be asked to operationally define a term on the writing portion of the AP exam. Now that your hypothesis is locked in, your variables are clearly defined, and your prediction is set up to be tested, and yes, falsifiable, you're probably feeling like a research rock star. But now comes the big question. How are you actually going to study this thing? The truth is, psychologists have an entire toolbox of research methods, because there's more than one way to study human behavior. Sometimes, psychologists run experiments where they tweak one variable to see what happens. For example, they might change the amount of screen time before bed and measure how it affects participants' ability to fall asleep. Spoiler, doom scrolling Instagram 1am doesn't help. But other times, psychologists take a totally different approach. They might observe behavior in natural settings, look for relationships between variables, or dive deep into a single person or group through a detailed case study. These are called non-experimental methods, and they're just as important depending on the question you're asking. So, what's the big difference? Experiments can show cause and effect. They're specifically designed to test whether one variable changes another. Non-experimental methods cannot prove causation, but they're great for spotting patterns in the data, summarizing results across multiple studies, or diving deep into unique cases. There are four non-experimental methods you absolutely need to know. Correlational studies, naturalistic observation, case studies, and meta-analysis. We'll break each one of these down in later episodes. But for now, just remember, the question you're asking determines the best method to use. So, choose wisely, future psychologist. All right, let's lock in with a quick recap. We just laid the foundation for thinking like a psychologist. And honestly, that's what this entire course is built on. Tattoo this onto your psych brain. Psychological research helps separate gut feelings from facts. Our brains can't always be trusted, Thanks to cognitive biases like hindsight bias, confirmation bias, and overconfidence. A solid hypothesis must be falsifiable. It has to be testable and disprovable. Operational definitions must be specific and measurable. And psychologists use both experimental and non-experimental research methods to study behavior from every angle. All right, thanks for watching AP Psych Brainiacs. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that next video. And as always, when in doubt, trust the data not your gut.